Hello, I'm Ted Seides, and this is Investment Management Operations. This show explores the inner workings of the most sophisticated institutions in the industry. Through conversations with executives across operations, compliance, legal, and finance, you'll hear how key operating partners run their businesses in an ever-changing and complex investment landscape. You can join our mailing list and access Capital Allocators content at capitalallocators.com. I'm Scott McDonald, and I'm your host. Today's sponsored insight highlights Intelligo, a risk intelligence and background check platform that blends human analysis with cutting edge AI to uncover facts in a fraction of the time. I sat down with Brian Gaffney of Stonehaven Partners to discuss the common challenges with background checks and how Intelligo helps streamline and scale their due diligence process. We then turn to the unique screens Brian uses for assessing risk, dealing with yellow and red flags, and how the network effect of our digital exhaust allow background checks to be completed faster so you can get your deal completed on schedule. Thanks again to Intelligo, and please enjoy my conversation with Brian Gaffney. Brian, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for having me. So want to dig into all things ODD and the background check process as a focus in particular, but Let's go back and give people an overview of your background and how you found yourself at Stonehaven. So I started my career out at KPMG in the financial services audit practice. I was primarily working on real estate clients like public REITs, developers, and funds. I also had the opportunity to work on some of the largest investment banks in the world like Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, Bredesco, CICC. Although I had a passion for real estate investments and operations, that experience at those large banks really helped me gain perspective into institutional level controls, risk management, governance practices, which isn't something that the real estate world is really known for prioritizing. So as I started to explore options outside of public accounting, I remember a conversation I had with a friend who was a financial services recruiter, and he was asking me, what sort of roles I would be interested in post public accounting. And I wanted to keep my options open. And I only really had two requirements. I didn't want to go to a big firm like Blackstone or KKR. And I didn't want to go into an internal audit role. And so naturally, I ended up accepting a position at Blackstone in the internal audit department. (laughs) (laughs) The irony. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. What was your decision framework on that? Why not big and Why not internal audit? I was always drawn to small firms, being big fish in a small pond and knowing everybody that I'm working with and knowing all the different levers that are pulled throughout an organization. I always felt like that's where I wanted to be. And it just happened that I started out at all these large places like KPMG and then Blackstone. And then after that, I moved over to GIC, and which I think was actually great. I think starting out my career at those big places really helped give me an unbelievable foundation. But I think just my mindset was always drawn to a smaller firm. And is that because what you see at a small firm versus what you might not see at a large firm? It's just being able to understand all of the moving parts, an entire organization. No one person, maybe except for Steve Schwartz or John Gray, know what's going on across all of Blackstone. That also is what intrigued me about the internal audit role at Blackstone. It was one of the few non-senior executive positions that got to see across the entire organization. I was like, wow, you're telling me that I can spend time on the private equity business and the real estate business and GSO, the credit business and the hedge fund business and corporate finance. And I get to see all of that in one year. That's super interesting because nobody else is seeing anything more than one lane within one segment. My mindset was always drawn towards that kind of environment. The Blackstone team there is what won me over, the quality of the team, how they thought about internal audits role within the organization. But pairing that with the firm's culture, which I was just immediately drawn to every person that you met with, it was just so clear that the only objective was excellence. It wasn't about, hey, 
How do we compare to the next person? We have our own ideas. We have confidence they're going to be excellent. And I just love that. So it really changed my mindset about joining a big firm. My day-to-day responsibilities there were to manage the SOX compliance program. I got to work with all the various business units, understand and document their processes. And then I'd be reviewing any of the deficiencies that were identified during the independent testing of those processes. So I got to see how did they design these things? What went wrong when somebody actually like lifted up the hood? And how do we fix that? Or how do we change it to make it better? And so that was really interesting. You have a high charging organization. And then you're coming in and saying, hey, here's what we're doing wrong. Any advice that you give for people? How do you navigate that? Because that internal audit role is really hard. My approach to internal audit when I was there was you're the subject matter expert. I'm here to learn from you. And I felt like what I was good at was just asking the why questions and letting people figure it out on their own. And it's like, okay, how do we sit down and instead of just pontificating and saying, well, you should be doing this. I don't know. I've never done a valuation for a real estate buyout. I don't know exactly what to do. I get it. I know all the underlying pieces and I'm listening to what you're saying, but let's explore this a little bit. Why do you do it this way? Help me understand. And in that process, I found some people would stumble upon ideas and we'd explore things together and say, hey, let's make a note to change this for next year. That was always my approach. On the project side, though, I actually had the opportunity to work closely on the BREIT launch, which was really one of the major things that I got to accomplish while I was there. It took over a year to do. It really was the relaunch of the non-traded REIT business, which had died down for a decade or so. And Blackstone was the one who relaunched that fund structure. And then a lot of the others followed along. The Starwoods and the KKRs, et cetera, also have non-traded REITs. When I got to work on that project, I got to go to the underlying portfolio companies who were doing a lot of the asset management work for the portfolios and do the same thing talk with the management teams at Equity Office and LiveCore and understand what are your processes to get all this information up to the mothership. I thought that was really just an incredible experience. And how long were you at Blackstone for? I was there just for two years. At the end of two years, after the BREAP project was wrapped up, there was some turnover in my team, at the head of the team. I had to make a decision as to whether I wanted to double down with the new team and maybe a new direction. It was a really challenging decision. Or do I take that as an opportunity to say, hey, okay, it's a fork in the road, so to speak, and which way do I go, left or right? At that time, a super unique opportunity came up with GIC, the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund, that got my attention. They were looking to build an operational due diligence function focused on supporting their non-hedge fund asset classes. So most notably, their real estate and private equity portfolios. At the time, a majority of the deal volume was coming out of the America's office, but they were also still developing back in Singapore, the ODD framework for all of private markets. And how does this work? And how do we just incorporate this with our GP relationships? I really came in to start working on new GP relationships as I'm building a framework for handling non-hedge fund deals or GP investments, and then over time, catch up on the existing portfolio. I, of course, at the time, knew very little about what ODD actually entailed, other than it seemed like something that only hedge fund teams had to deal with. This was back, I think, before a lot of the large LPs and really thought about private markets the same way from an operational risk perspective. And so right at that time, there were a lot of organizations dealing with that same question. Okay, we do ODD for hedge funds, and we have been since Madoff. There's been no Madoffs in the private markets, at least not at the same scale, but there's a lot of little things that are going wrong here. And how do we think about risk the same way and apply a similar mindset to the private markets? GIC had a very sophisticated ODD team in place focused on hedge funds that they've been doing for a long time just incredible talent on that team. The way I looked at it was, I might have no experience in ODD. I might not even really know what it is, but these guys can teach me. Hopefully I can bring a unique perspective having worked with PE structures 
and thinking about risks that are really meaningful to those investments, not just trying to copy a framework that's meaningful for hedge funds into private markets and adjusting, really thinking from scratch what makes sense here and meeting in the middle. Working for a sovereign wealth fund, it seems like the mission is totally different than working at a Blackstone. What are your thoughts on that? It was easy for me because GSC is very commercial. They really do run themselves as a top tier asset management firm, but it was paired with the mission. I think having that pride of your mission to helping the people of Singapore preserve and grow their reserves really is incredible. But for me, it was never a challenge because it was just another top tier asset management firm with incredibly talented people with some of the top resources in the world. I was at GSC just under four years. We had the new framework solidly in place and we were operating at full capacity there. And I'm now 10 years of experience in. I want to do something a bit more entrepreneurial. I want to get back to being in the smaller pond. I want to have more control over all different types of processes that are going on and understand how a business works and be a key decision maker there. And so I left to join Stonehaven as the head of due diligence and mandate management. I'm a partner there today. Could you just give me an overview of the, all the different pieces of Stonehaven and what you guys are doing there? Stonehaven's a fintech capital markets platform. We've built architecture to support placement agents and investment bankers to raise capital, do M&A transactions and secondary transactions across a wide range of companies and asset classes, hedge funds, private equity, venture capital, real estate infrastructure. We've built an operating system that really encompasses technology, infrastructure, and data which brings together a collaboration network to enable people on our platform who we'd refer to as affiliate partners to originate various mandates in the marketplace and collaborate with each other across the platform to execute on those mandates. The easiest way to think about our business model at a fundamental level is the real estate brokerage business model. And so you have independent real estate agents who are out selling houses but they're affiliated with Keller Williams or Daniel Gale or any of these large brokerage houses. They can go out and get their own listings. They have their own buyers and sellers. But at the end of the day, they need to be under the broker's license. And that broker provides a lot of support. They provide resources, technology, access to MLS, et cetera. And we're kind of similar in that. The one unique piece is that in the securities industry, it is very difficult to co-collaborate with other agents, unlike in the real estate world, where they could just pop in through MLS and it's very easy. In the securities world, it is not that easy. We've really tried to build scale within our platform for people to collaborate and make it pretty simple. So today we're supporting over 100 investment bankers and placement agents who in turn are supporting over 250 companies and asset management firms. We have over 350 collaboration agreements within that network. We're the U.S. broker dealer for all of these agents. And so as part of that, we've had to build all of the compliance, legal, due diligence, finance elements, which we've done in our tech stack to support the entire life cycle of the deals that these affiliate partners are working on. And where do your responsibilities fit into Stonehaven? I oversee all things mandates. So from the very beginning of the mandate life cycle, which really starts with signing an NDA with a potential client, to contracting and negotiating commercial terms with that client, to onboarding them, which is due diligence them from a counterparty perspective, making sure that we perform our regulatory obligation, but also our firm-wide due diligence minimum requirements, from there, supporting that mandate through the execution process. And so helping our affiliate partners to build those syndications and promote cross-marketing, really anything that touches our capital raising clients falls under my team. What does that process look like for you guys? We start off with our contracting. Our affiliate partners submit the commercial terms that they would like to work under for these engagements. We give them a lot of flexibility to set their own commercial terms. After all, these guys are running their own businesses. They're independently branded. And so 
we help to support them to say, hey, listen, these are market terms or these are off market terms. We should maybe adjust these slightly. But at the end of the day, we participate alongside them on the commercial terms that they set with their clients. Once we've signed the contract, then our affiliate partners have to go into our portal and fill in a mandate onboarding form. And the mandate onboarding form basically gives us a high level understanding of what is the offering that they're looking to solicit or raise for or transact. It's a dynamic form. So if you're working on a company in a series A direct deal, it'll have questions about what's the pre-money valuation, what's the structure, how much revenue have they had, et cetera. Whereas if you're working on a hedge fund or last you about redemption terms and subscription terms. And so we have this dynamic DDQ, so to speak, that the affiliate partner is responsible for submitting to us. From there, we have a pretty complex backend workflow that my team handles, lots of different tasks. So we go out and run AML KYC checks and we screen the company's LinkedIn and pull in public source data into our system. And we say, okay, can we find data on all the key employees of this company publicly, whether it's their website or offering materials or whatever, pull them all to our system and run a data scrubbing exercise. And then we run background checks on key principles of the organization. And then we have the firm sign off on all the due diligence information that was submitted to us. So we pull it all together and say, okay, here's our due diligence file. Here's a summary of everything our affiliate partner submitted to us. Is this all accurate? And then the last step is reviewing all the marketing materials that are going out. So anything that our affiliate partners are using in the marketplace, we have to review and approve. And so we're going through and looking at that and making sure that there's no aggressive statements and everything is internally reconciling. They're saying the same thing in their marketing deck as they're saying in their PPMs, et cetera. How often does it happen where you present information and they go, that's not me, false positive, as we say. How often does that happen? In the context of background checks, I think we have had that come up from time to time. The tools that we're using have really done a good job utilizing AI to give us a high degree of confidence that the items that we're seeing are actually related to the client. We are able to do a good job based on some of the data scrubbing that we're doing. First saying like, hey, is this the right LinkedIn or is this the right crunch base? Is this the right pitch book profile, et cetera. Once we pull that in and we submit that over to our background check provider, they do a really good job using a lot of those inputs to say, okay, this news media article or this litigation is actually this person to a pretty high degree of confidence. What was the process like when you first started and then where are you today? on the background check side? That was really one of the first things that I did when I got to Stonehaven. After 60 days, I took a step back. I said, okay, where are the major choke points in our process right now? And the biggest one was background checks. We were at the time using a provider where we had to send a form to the target that we were running the background check on, who a lot of the times is the CEO of the company or the chief investment officer. It was effectively the same as a new hire report that you'd make with any HR company. And so they've got to go through and fill out this long form with their social security number and birthday, and they get pinged with this email that they have to go do it, and it gets lost in spam, and then they don't do it. And so it would take sometimes weeks just to get the client to fill in the form to authorize us to go get the background check. Once we did that, It took another three to five days for things to start coming back. And sometimes it would drag out for weeks if they couldn't get specific information to a specific court or something like that. I was like, we can't be sitting in the background check phase of onboarding for four to six weeks. It's just too long. Early stage direct deals are the life cycle is only three months to begin with. What somebody's going out and raising around. I had actually been connected with Intelligo four years earlier and was familiar with the tool and the process there. I was like, hey, this is a really good opportunity to change providers, bypass the authorizations, because for investment-related checks, you do not need the target to authorize the check. And so just in our contracts with the clients, 
we just make it known. We'll be doing background checks on the key people here, but we don't need them to specifically authorize each check for specific people. Tell me more about what exactly IntelliGo is. IntelliGo is an Israeli-based artificial intelligence tool that runs background checks on individuals and companies. The company really grew up with Israeli intelligence agents. That was their background after their time in the service there, spun out and created this company and said, we can use a lot of the same tools to go out and scrub public source information to give a higher quality, faster turnaround time background check. Pairing that with the user interface of the background check report was incredibly easy to navigate for somebody who is not living in background checks every day. For me, that was incredibly important because as an ODD professional, you're the first person reviewing the background checks, but you want buy-in from the key portfolio manager or the key investment decision maker to say, hey, I know about all these things and I'm good with them. And Intelgo reports were so easy for somebody who doesn't really get what's going on to go in and capture what are the key points right away that I need to focus on and basically sign off that I understand these and I'm good with these. And so that was really important to me. And also taking that to Stonehaven, it was a similar mindset. Our affiliate partners they're effectively selling these clients and they are meeting with investors every day. They've got busy schedules to have them combing through detailed 40 page background check reports with a lot of detail without a real way of pulling out, okay, what's the key thing that I need to take away here? It's just not practical. Nobody's going to do that unless that's your job. So I thought it was a good opportunity to say, okay, you can bring Intelligo in, cut the turnaround time to a business day. We can keep costs roughly the same or slightly improve our current cost model. And we can provide a report to the key person who's marketing this client to really understand who their client is and what are some of the potential background check items that they should be aware of very quickly. It seems like under the old process, you would have to actually start the background check before you're even done. This is a go, no go. So oftentimes, given the fragmentation and the delays, you would have to actually start burning time and effort on something that may not even be something you're going to focus on. Oh, we're incredibly focused on false starts. So last year, we onboarded over 120 new clients. Those are GPs and companies that we've got a diligence. That's just the amount of people that went through the full contracting, due diligence, and now are out to marketplace with them. There is a significant multiple more that start and die somewhere along that process for various different reasons. And due diligence is one of those reasons. When a placement agent or investment banker decides to start exploring working with a client, they're doing a high level of understanding of the client. They want to set contractual terms, and then they start lifting under the hood. And sometimes when you start to lift under the hood, you say, oh, wait, actually, this isn't what I thought, and maybe I don't have the right investors for this client. Maybe this isn't the right engagement for me at this time. And so they step away. We knew background checks were going to take us a minimum of a week. On average, two, we had some outlier cases that were five months we've been sitting in the background check phase. And the whole due diligence process that we've created is really designed to be a five-day process for everything else. We've basically said our background check process has to be something that starts and is completed at the early part of that process to prevent false starts. And really, Intelligo has helped us to do that and cut out a lot of potential work on deals that wouldn't have moved forward for one reason or another based on the background check results alone. So you have an engagement. How deep into the executive team are you going? We're typically going at the key principles. We're looking at key persons of the fund. We might look at the CFO. We're looking at the key individuals that we think it's reasonable that our investors are also looking at. We do have a regulatory obligation to do this. Just to take a quick step back on our overall due diligence framework, the first pillar that we have to keep in mind is that we are a FINRA broker dealer and we have a regulatory obligation to do certain things. We have an automatic minimum bar we have to hit where even in our judgment, if we want to go lower, we cannot. So we have that first bar. But the second pillar is that 
We want to provide comfort within our community because Stonehaven's fundamentally built to create network effects between these independent investment bankers and placement agents who are working on deals that they're maybe not as close to. So within our system, we have a mandates page for all the active deals that are open to collaboration. And it's really seamless for somebody to say, hey, listen, my client's looking for litigation finance manager, and we have three different litigation finance managers that various affiliate partners are working on. Look at these three and pick one and then go do a meeting a week later. It's really easy to do that. And so we need to make sure that within our community, our affiliate partners are comfortable that there's been a base level of diligence done on these managers that they can rely on so that they don't have to go in deep themselves. We have that ingrained in our process to have that minimum threshold for our affiliate partners. And the third is just reputational across Stonehaven. As a entity and as a platform, we have a reputational line that we just do not want to be associated with certain products or individuals. I've found throughout my career that every investor has their own standards and their own willingness to accept what we might call like a yellow or a red flag. We're never going to be perfectly aligned with everybody and their specific risk appetite. So it's really about understanding the story that that flag is telling you, understanding what happened, how forthcoming was the manager or the company with this information, and just being able to support your position and sleep at night, so to speak. That's what decides whether it's a pass or fail. That third one is really where Intelligo comes into play here and gives us a lot of that information where in our due diligence form, the manager might have already disclosed a certain item. So we already know that this is going to come up, which obviously goes a long way, right? Transparency. Intelligo helps us to identify, okay, what are the other pieces here that they're not telling us? And then we dive into those a little bit deeper and say, hey, what's the story here? Navigating the yellow flag is really hard. What is the mindset of Stonehaven on these things? Red is easier, I think, because a lot of those are go, no go. And so there's obvious things. If there's some regulatory incident where they're not able to even participate on a private placement offering anymore, or they've had some sort of fraud incident recently, those are pretty cut and dry to deal with. The yellows are the things that show personal character or show public attention. And that's more of an art than a science. Again, disclosure about a lot of things is really important for non-personal business-related things. I don't think people think when they're doing background checks to investors to immediately think, oh, hey, I've gotten 20 parking tickets in the last year, or I've had 17 speeding tickets over the last three years, which is a yellow flag. It just shows you something and you have to figure out what is that something. There's no secret sauce there. I wish there was. It's really an art and diving in and trying to say, okay, let me fit all the pieces of the puzzle together. And then from there, I always find having a conversation after I'm armed with all these things is what usually tilts me on one side or the other. It is definitely art and science. I want to go back to really just focus on Intelligo a little bit. There's been a lot of evolution in the market in this space. Could you just share a little bit more about what Intelligo is providing for you guys? Yeah, first and fundamentally, they're providing access to a lot of public source information that would take us a lot of resources to go scrub ourselves. They've pulled in a lot of artificial intelligence and hooks to go out and scrub all these databases or get behind paywalls that we don't want to go subscribe to each of these different tools to go check. And so first, it's just leveraging that efficiency that they've built. Second is constantly evolving that user interface. Four years ago, when I started getting involved with Intelligo, it was a great interface and they've only made it better over time. I think staying on top of that, easy to digest, easy to assess what are the key items here. They've made a lot of tweaks on logic around what's a yellow flag or what's a red flag to help calibrate that sort of thing based on user feedback. So they're actually making a judgment or at least helping guide. Is it a yellow? Because a lot of my experience at a lot of these firms, they won't tell you they just back up the truck and it's up to you to determine what's important. But it seems like there's a little bit of judgment on here's some things to take a look at closely. That's right. They're absolutely making a judgment in some of these things. And it's just like with anything, you get more and more comfort over time. Having worked with them and now run hundreds and hundreds of background check reports through them, 
we're pretty comfortable that if it's meaningful, they're probably going to put a yellow flag next to it. We're not going to see something that they don't flag at least yellow that we really want to go pay attention to, which obviously helps our efficiency quite a bit. The judgment between yellow and red, as I mentioned, I think that's person to person. And so I would say they do a good job of flagging that, but there's still a lot of those overlays that you always have to do and say, okay, like for me, actually, this yellow is more of a red. Again, I have that context of actually knowing the person or actually seeing what they've disclosed to me. That context can elevate yellow to a red. And similarly, it can say, just because they had a bankruptcy as an example, how many years ago was it? What was the nature of the bankruptcy? Was it 2008 and he lost his job at one of the banks that collapsed and had a mortgage and kids? That was the problem there. Does it show about their financial judgment? What was the story here? Let's actually downgrade this to a yellow. And you can just do that right in the tool and override their initial judgments. Can you see how it's progressing? So that goes into monitoring. It is the other tool that they have available. So you can sign up those profiles to get ongoing alerts. One of the biggest things that Intelligo has done, and this has evolved over time, at the beginning of Intelligo's journey, you had a news section. And I think it was helpful because they actually flagged the news as yellow, red. You could scroll through and get right to the links. So it was only slightly differentiated from the old way, but they've since done a really great job of condensing a lot of those stories and a lot of the noise. And so that's the biggest thing with monitoring. If I'm working with a high profile GP or high profile company, I'm going to get pinged constantly. I know that. I don't necessarily want to read all of these. And a lot of them are the same thing, same articles that just get picked up by six or seven different news sources. You're seeing six emails or six alerts. And Intelligo has done a really great job of just using AI to condense that and say, here's the related stories, but here's the main thing that people are reporting on and whether it's yellow or red. There's just an evolution, as we all know, the amount of digital exhaust we are all throwing off as individuals. Everything used to be only in paper, but now everyone's out there, whether you like it or not. When the screen is done, what's the first thing you like to go to? This is probably not as new as some of the other features, but one of the really great things that I actually love on Teleco is there's an asset section. And so you can go in and see people's personal assets. It's public record what kind of car you drive. A lot of the times you get a GP that talks about how financially conservative they are. Hey, I drive a 14-year-old Honda Civic. But then you go on to Teleco and you see, okay, yeah, they do have a 14-year-old Honda Civic, but they've also got all these high-end cars and they also just bought a $6 million house. And by the way, it's mortgaged for $5 million. All that's public source. And so that helps to tell the story. I actually spend a good amount of time in those sorts of screens, which aren't really red flaggy type things. It's more just who am I dealing with? On the public profile side, what they do a good job is pulling in all those public profiles. So it's like, I don't have to go find you on Twitter and find you on LinkedIn, and find you all these places, all the links right there. And I could just easily say, okay, you've now mapped for me all of the places that these people are in the public sphere. And I can go in, they can pull out and give you risk flags over what are these people saying? If somebody's posting really egregious events of things on Twitter or did post that five years ago, how would I know about that? Until it comes out in the media, and now I'm trying to do damage control because I'm working with somebody who posted something on Twitter five years back that now is just being dug up because there was a large public transaction. So now the media is going and looking for it. And so Intelligo helps pull that together, analyze old posts, and say, here are some old posts you should be aware of or you should assess. So when this stuff happens, is this where you just have your other team members log in and look at it? How are you getting by on the whole yellow flag situation? We subscribe and I think are a pretty major user of the fully automated tool that Intelligo makes available. So it's the most cost efficient, it's fully automated, and we basically get all the data before it's scrubbed. And the reason for that is I have a five-person team supporting me that can go and actually look at this and make some of those judgment calls. And I would prefer to have some false positives or maybe make some of those risk decisions myself first at a lower cost point that is quicker turnaround time and then have the ability to upgrade. So Intelligo has 
a lot more specialized experience than my team does in reviewing some of these things. But when you start to see an issue and you want insights on it, you can upgrade directly in the tool. So I just click there and say, I don't know what's going on here. There's a lot of links. There's 40 litigations that are mentioning fraud over the last five years. I don't want to go read 40 documents. I don't know what happened. I don't know if these are all the same cases. I don't really know. I want to read it and understand. But it's more efficient for Intelligo to do that. So I can upgrade the report and have a specialized Intelligo agent actually read the report, summarize everything, fact check. Is this the right person? Is it not? And then give us a fully baked report in that same user interface. So they're effectively just like cleaning up noise, summarizing. That's a really effective tool for us to be able to utilize as an extension of team, extension of bandwidth. And it will save you dollars because typically under the old process, you have to do that up front where it seems like if you could do that along like, hey, we see something over here. Do you want to go explore? The reality is 50 or 60% of the background checks that you're going to run don't have anything in them. It's just bland. There's really nothing there. That's a really high number. When you're working with emerging managers who are growing up new in the industry, they don't have a lot of scar tissue. Yeah, you're not getting a lot of litigation. People, generally speaking, in the financial services industry are not committing crimes. There isn't a whole lot of negative news associated with them. And they're not lying about their education, et cetera. Not that there isn't insightful information to pull away, like I mentioned, but 50, 60%, you're doing your job of validating, okay, yes, the bio this person gave me, they did go to this school. They did graduate here. They did work at these companies. They didn't have any litigation. It's negative confirmation. And so for us, that quick stamp of approval at a really low cost point for us is really helpful. We could just move on. It's a binary outcome. Once you start to get flags, that sort of thing, how do you resource for that? What if the amount of people that we're doing things with increase? How do I plan for that next year in my resource allocation? I can't. If my time on background checks grows 100% year over year, what am I going to go hire another resource for just for that year? What if it starts to go back the other way, right? So having that extension of resource, that really practical extension of resource for IntelliGo, who's already connected into the data that you've run, to be able to go in and validate it, I think it's just really helpful for our scalability. That's really powerful. And the other interesting thing is the fact that even though it's a digital dashboard of information, you also can talk to somebody. 100%. We have monthly meetings with the IntelliGo team to just overview new functionality, issues that are coming up, or make suggestions and say, hey, listen, this flag was flagging yellow. We actually don't even need it to be flagged yellow because it's a non-issue for us and make customizations, having that personal support behind a really powerful AI tool is really important for us. What about using the network effects of trying to debunk the whole false positive situation? That is something Intelligo has frankly already done a very good job of. We don't really get as many false positives with Intelligo as we did in the old way, or if you plug something into some other alert database that just pings you emails on everybody named Robert Smith. We don't run across a lot of false positives, except for in instances where you get incredibly unfortunate that some same name, same birth date from the same hometown, like you might get something there. But I think, yes, that technology will continue to evolve. And it has. We've definitely seen over the last four or five years, less and less and less false positives. Do I think that could ever fully go away? No, I don't think so. One of the things, though, that I think people have to make the decision on is I can either go and get your social security number and your birthday and run your background check that way with your permission. But in those cases, you're going to be running a background check on the data that has that information associated with it. That's how you don't have false positives. It doesn't cast as wide of a net because they're only gonna report information that they're certain is you. We've found a lot of things that have come up that are like, how the heck did it associate this with this person? But which comes back to disclosure. Out of those 50% of people where there is something there, there is not as much disclosure as you would think around some of these things. Frankly, a lot of people are surprised that we're able to find those items. What types of reporting does Intelligo provide? 
the now report, which is the one that we utilize, I think from a scalability perspective, which is what we're focused on at Stonehaven is how do we build scale for all our affiliate partners? How do we reduce turnaround time, get them feedback quicker so that they're not wasting time themselves working with clients. We're not wasting time doing due diligence. The now product has really been game changing for us as we've scaled to get instantaneous feedback. We're getting reports in four hours. Their SLA is 24 hours. So I can safely say we've less than 5% have taken more than four hours. The levels that they have is the now, which is the AI automated check. So you can go in, you plug in all the information that you have, which when we're going to work with a client or an individual, we generally will know what their LinkedIn is. We'll have a general bio from their deck or their website that you can plug in. And it'll go through and it'll scan the bio and say, okay, you know, they said they graduated from Harvard with an MBA, but actually on this public source data, it said that they didn't complete the MBA if they left after a year. So it flags inconsistencies within their self-reported information as well. And that's the report that spits out everything without a human intervention. And so I can get that with pretty incredible accuracy very quickly at a very reasonable price point. So I can really focus on what are my highest risk profiles, spend my resources there, both from like a dollar's perspective and from a human capital perspective. But for that 50, 60%, I've cast the net pretty wide. There's nothing out there in the stratosphere. Let's move on and let's get this thing off the ground. And that has helped us tremendously in our scalability. How important is that to actually closing business? You might lose business to a competitor if you're too slow. When we sign the contract to go market either a company or a fund manager, they sign the contract and they're expecting investor meetings the next day. When we have to come back to them and say, hey, listen, yeah, we signed the contract yesterday, but now we actually have to do due diligence. They get it. But that doesn't mean let's now spend the next three weeks just doing due diligence and not doing any investor outreach. They're generally pretty good at saying, okay, let's spend the next few days for you to get to know us. But that's the window of time we have. We don't want to spend the next few days doing that if we know that there's something over here that's going to prevent us from working with you. Frankly, they're pretty frustrated too if they just spent all that time working with us, investing in us as a service provider to go market for them. And there is some issue that we can't get past. And now we say, oh, listen, in your background check, you had this incident here. We can't work with you. They're pretty frustrated. And we want to avoid client friction and just move on and part ways cleanly and have it be a good experience, even in those situations. So if you work with a manager, you're going to raise capital and then you have prospects. If I'm a potential LP, can I rely on that information that you guys have done? Or do I need to do that independently myself? Every LP has their own risk appetite. Going from an ODD role at GIC and knowing the risk appetite and the investment frameworks there to the role in Stonehaven, it is a very different lens. We are a broker dealer with the responsibility to market a product that is suitable for the investor that we're soliciting. And so I have to take it from a lens of, is this investment suitable for some target universe that we're intending to cover. And there's a good chunk of product that's like, this is not a product that is suitable for a high net worth investor or a family office even that's not that sophisticated. This is an incredibly complex product. And we have to take this to only the people that are living and breathing this product and understand the risks associated with it. So yeah, I do think that having that mindset of, okay, I got to figure out Who is this applicable for and is it applicable to somebody is very different than being a single LP and saying, okay, I know what's suitable for me or I know what I want to target. What do you think the next chapter is in this area? What are the trends for ODD and ODD tech? There's really two things. And you mentioned one of them already is that our public profiles are exponentially growing. And so finding the amount of places where somebody's public profile exists, really being positioned to have access and know where to look for all of that is super, super, super important. And so knowing that we have a top provider out there who's spending resources just looking for that. And I think the second is artificial intelligence. 
five, six years ago when Intelgo came out and said, hey, we're an AI tool using artificial intelligence to background check. People weren't really using artificial intelligence in a lot of different ways. And so that was the first mention for me on real artificial intelligence and what it was capable of doing in terms of summarizing a lot of data. I think as artificial intelligence gets better, we're going to see even more value add in terms of what does this mean? So I have to spend less time carving through documents. I think there will always be a need to have a conversation. I don't think it can totally replace people, but just making that more efficient or giving you better information to have those conversations. So Brian, I we like to ask two closing questions with all guests. The first one is, what advice would you give an emerging manager? Stonehaven, we were ranked last year by Pitchbrook as the number one placement agent for emerging managers. And so we work with a tremendous amount of emerging managers. And one of the biggest things is that underwriting risk for emerging managers, the business risk component is a major part of that analysis. And so investors are factoring in whether principals have the resources or the track record of managing a fund business while continuing to make good investment decisions. And there's absolutely a reason why investors choose to simply never invest in a first-time fund. No matter how compelling the opportunity is, no matter how on target the thesis is with their overall thesis, it's just, hey, we don't do first-time funds, we'll be back for the second one. There's a reason for that because business risk is hard to underwrite if you haven't done it before, how do you deal with the first time the SEC comes in and asks you a whole bunch of questions? Does that impact your performance that quarter because you're now distracted? So I think focusing on operational scale early is really important for an emerging manager. Investors want to know that your growth and increased complexity won't negatively impact their experience or their investment returns. And so two just quick suggestions is first, Review the DDQ templates that are available for some of the major industry associations. ILPA puts them out, InRev, AMA. Review those upfront before an investor asks you for them. Because if an investor asks, they're expecting that to come back in a few weeks. That's not enough time to put thoughtful framework level responses. And many of those questions are going to actually indicate to you best practices and expectations. And the second is, Find service providers that you can grow with. Don't just find the cheapest provider to do the job that's needed today. Don't do your RFPs on fund admins and just say, okay, nine BIPs on nav, eight BIPs on nav, and this is the lowest one. Find a team that you can scale with that's going to help you grow as a business that doesn't mind giving you that operational insight to scale. All good suggestions. And the other question I have is, what is the one industry resource you most commonly refer to people? I feel like this answer is cheating a little bit, but the big one recently is ChatGPT. Over the last six months, I'm using ChatGPT every day as a resource to help me digest information quicker for a lot of different subject areas. Where I used to go to a law firm with a higher level question and have to go down steps of advice or guidance, kind of multiple calls to unpack certain items, I can now spend 20 minutes in ChatGPT, get 70% of the way there and have a much more focused conversation with legal, which helps save me money, time. I think if you're an operational person in the investment management industry and you're not ramped up on ChatGPT and exactly how to prompt it for the responses you need, you're going to be very far behind pretty quickly. All good stuff. Ryan, thanks for the time today. A lot of insight. Appreciate your perspective on Intelligo and look forward to staying in touch. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Scott. Thanks for listening to the show. If you like what you heard, hop on our website at capitalallocators.com where you can access past shows, join our mailing list, and sign up for premium content. Have a good one and see you next time.